Is he saying this, that it just is an inescapable empirical fact that we're all directly familiar with? Yes. That whether we like it or not, most of us at least simply do have moral convictions yes. which we find ourselves unable to ignore even when we want to. Yes. And that's a fact. Now, yes. for these convictions to have any real validity or significance at all, the essential moral terms like good, bad, right, wrong, yes. praise, blame, etc., yes. for these to have any significance at all, there must be some freedom of choice. It must be uh, yes. possible for some of us, some of the time, to yes. have done other than we did. Otherwise, the terms are meaningless. Yes. But how is that possible, uh, on the one hand, in a world in which all uh, uh, yes. notions of matter are governed by Newtonian laws? That was one problem that you yes. started us off with right at the very beginning of the discussion. Yes. But also, um, for, for us to have free will, which he thinks is an inescapable consequence of the uh, direct experience yes. we do have of moral categories, then there must be some sort of moral realm. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Now, how does he get even further, as it were, from that to God? Or... I mean, what he says about himself, um, thinking about... Uh, theology and religion, I think, specifically. He says that he had denied knowledge in order to make room for faith. Uh, he had simply shown why it was that the sort of subject matter of theology, if I could put it like that, is not a possible topic of knowledge. But then he says, what's alarming about that? Because we've all, all known all along that it's essentially a matter of faith. But as you rightly say, and one could claim that his arguments have really been rather more radical than that. It isn't just that when I talk about God, I'm saying things that I don't know to be true. Uh, his argument really seems to lead to the conclusion that I don't know what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> what I'm saying doesn't really mean anything. That is but he was very reluctant to draw that conclusion. Yes. What he tries to say is, all I've done is to show that it's not a matter of knowledge or proof. Yes. And his point on that, issue, I suppose, is this, that it, whereas it's uh, superstitious to rest on faith over a question which can actually be decided exactly. one way or the exactly. other, if the question can't be decided one way or the other, it's not irrational to have belief on one Absolutely. side. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the very beginning of this discussion, Sir mm. Geoffrey, you said that, that what the problem that yes. could usefully be regarded as having, as it were, launched Kant on his philosophical enterprise was a perception of an apparent uh, conflict between uh, Newtonian physics yes. and the requirements of ethics. How in the light of everything we've said up to this point did he solve that problem? Um, yes. Um, to really a uh, quite minimal extent, I think, and I think this was something of which he was himself perfectly aware. What he would claim is that um, by making clear the distinction between the world as an appearance, as an object of experience, and the world of things in themselves, he is in a position to say there is the world of appearances and the physical sciences in principle give us the whole truth about that. And he believed that they did. He had no doubt that Newton had got it absolutely right and that um, a physicist's description of the world as an object of possible experience was correct and could be exhausted. But, he says, uh, bear in mind that we are there talking about the world of appearances. There is also um, the topic of things in themselves, and there is room, so to speak, there for other sorts of concepts altogether, of free will, of rational agency, right and wrong, good and bad, so there is room for these concepts, not in the world of appearance, 
but uh, outside the world of appearance. Uh, of course, he saw that on his own principles, he would have to say that these other matters couldn't be topics of knowledge. And I mean, had you said to him, do you know that there is such a thing as free will? He would consistently have said, no, I do not know any such thing. All I know is that there is room for that possibility. And that I can't help believing that there is. Oh, certainly. Yes, you would yeah. have gone on to say that, yeah. too. Given that on this view, ethics comes to us somehow from outside ah, the world yes. of all possible knowledge, yes. does he have a view about where it comes from or how we get it? Um, well, he thought it came out of reason. I think it'll help us to understand that problem further. If you, if, if you tell us what the main conclusions of his moral philosophy were. It's quite impossible, I think, in the context of this discussion to go into the arguments with which he supported those conclusions. Yes. But if you are able out to outline the conclusions for us briefly, I think that will contribute to an understanding. Mm. I think one could say something quite briefly about that. Uh, what he really tries to do in his moral philosophy is somehow extract the essentials of morality from the pure concept of rationality. He says the, the essential thing about any agent of whom one can think or speak in moral terms is that he must be a rational being capable of thinking of reasons for and against doing this and that. And he tries to argue that the essential requirements of morality are really built into the concept of rationality itself. Um, essentially, trying to show that, uh, well, he seems to try to show that um, only uh, a body of principles of action um, corresponding to our principles of morality could consistently, i.e. rationally, be universally adopted by a community of rational beings. That's what he tries to show. <laughs> and there is the famous categorical imperative, which yes. of course directly derives from that. Yes. Perhaps I should ask you to formulate it rather When he says, act only on that maxim which by which you can, at the same time, will that it should be a universal law. Um, and I think that is the idea. He, he, he wants to say that what morality really imposes on us is conditions on conduct um, which require, and I think he also thinks uniquely determine, the assent of any possible community of rational creatures. That's what he's trying to do. Now, Kant's philosophy is notoriously difficult to understand at a first encounter, and I'm yes. sure that many of the people listening to this discussion <laughs> between you and me are experiencing this yes. difficulty now. I think uh, fundamental to the difficulty is his contention that of things as they are in themselves, we simply have no knowledge and no way of mm. acquiring that we are, as it were, permanently screened off from this by our own limitations. Yes. And these are partly limitations, as it were, in time and space. Yes. Is it helpful, do you think, to say to, pe to point out to people, look, in a quite different context, something very much of this sort is what many religious people have always believed, that, as it were, real reality is outside this world of our experience outside space yes. and time, and that this world of our experience is ephemeral and perhaps uh, illusory in some yes. metaphysical sense. Is it helpful to say that, or do you think that just obscures the issue? No, I don't think it does. Um, I mean, if, for example, I mean, one raises the rather, um, in a sense, hypothetical and perhaps idle question, what sort of being one would have to be 
to be acquainted with things as they are in themselves. The only possible answer you can get out of Kant is that it would have to be God, in fact. Yes. Um, that's to say, you would be acquainted with things in some timeless way and without any kind of spatial limitations and with no particular sensory limitations on the mode of your acquaintance and I'm not thinking in English or French or any other particular language, your acquaintance with the universe would be not subject to any of these limitations. And if you say, well, and what would I have to be to be like that? The only answer is I'd have to be God. Uh, 